open up your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Paul, of course, writes Ephesians to tell us about the glorious gospel of grace that we have in Christ Jesus, that we stand in in Christ Jesus, and he exhorts us to walk in a manner of life that's worthy of the high calling to which we have been called. That's what Ephesians is all about. Glory and walking. Walk according to the glorious grace you have received. Walk like it. Let's pray. Let's pray before we jump into our, 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 our message for tonight. Dear God in heaven, as we think on the future and we think about what every knee will do and what every tongue will confess in the future, when your son comes in his glory to receive the kingdom, to, to magnify your glory, to show off your plan and your grace, to show your faithfulness to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and your faithfulness to all those like us whom you have called. I pray that there would be not one person here who would not sing with joy in that day. I pray that all here would joyfully sing in that day, you reign, you reign forevermore. And I pray that we would begin to live lives filled with your grace, even tonight, and especially this summer, as we talk about what it looks like to help one another walk according to the great grace that we have received. I pray that you'd give every single student here a mind to hear the glorious truth of the gospel, even tonight, to believe even, to be saved, even if they have not done so already. And I pray that you would give us great traction in small group, in ministry, for being, being strong together this summer. We pray this all in, in your son's glorious name. Amen. I just want to do a quick introduction to youth group. So I'm only going to go 40 minutes tonight. This will be quick compared to what I normally do. So you guys can just sit back, relax. This is easy. I'm joking. There was a kid over there freaking out. No. Um, <laughs> But I do want to tell you that we want to be deliberate in youth ministry. I want to be deliberate in youth ministry. I don't want to waste my time in youth ministry. The small group leaders don't want to waste their time. Uh, Leaders, we have invested a lot of time into this ministry. We just spent an entire weekend investing a lot of time and sweat and energy and lack of sleep into this ministry. We want to be deliberate about it. Also, I would even say the older students also want to be deliberate. There's many older students in this room and in this ministry who don't want, don't want this group to be shaped any old way. They've worked hard to actually shape a culture and leave behind a legacy. Even students in this group care about this group. We don't want to waste our time here. And also our church. Our church has invested a lot of resources into this ministry. Every summer, they pile thousands of dollars on top of thousands of dollars to help all of you go to summer camp because they, they believe in what our ministry is about. Matter of fact, right now, they're investing money in our room because they believe that this ministry is worth pursuing. We want to be deliberate. We don't want to just hang out. We're not just here to play games all the time. We do believe in games. We do believe they're fun. But that's, that's not really the ultimate purpose why we're here. We're here to be deliberate, to do deliberate spiritual good for everyone, for everyone. We want to help you grow, in other words, in your skill of spiritual relationships, primarily with God, but also that also includes your skill of relating with one another, learning to be a Christian in the body of Christ. This is the theme that we're going to be talking about this summer. We're going to talk about the skill of relationships. Now, some of you are probably saying in your head, that's not very hard at all. I can do that in my sleep. I'm really good at talking to people. I talk to people all the day, all the time, all the time. I talk to my mom when I wake up. I talk to my dad when I go to bed. I'm really good at relationships. Well, I got an argument for you. That is not skillful relationships. Just being able to talk a lot doesn't mean you're good at relationships. 
I would say, a skill in pursuing God-glorifying relationships isn't just a special gift that a few have. It's, it's, it's not just for the social uh, butterflies of the group. It's, it's not for those people at all. It's for those people who seek it, who, who seek to develop it. It's, it's a skill that you actually need to develop. Otherwise, you will not have it. It's, it's not a personality trait. It's not a number in an enneagram form. It, it's a skill that you choose or do not choose to develop in your life. And your life will show it. it and, and let me explain it this way. You, you will no less uh, be a good husband or a good wife than you will be a good uh, parent. Or, or not a parent, no. An, an artist or an athlete or, or a pianist or a violinist. It actually takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of labor. It takes a lot of wisdom. And it takes a lot of skill to be a good husband and wife. And this also means it takes a lot of skill, uh, deliberate use of your time to be a good friend, to, to be a good sibling, to be a good son or daughter. It actually is a skill. It's what the Bible says is wisdom in your life. It's, it's wisdom coming into your heart and your mind and changing you. And it develops in you a skill of relating with other people. And we would say to you tonight that it's a skill worth pursuing. Matter of fact, it's a necessary skill. If you want to follow Jesus, if you want to be a faithful follower of Christ, a disciple of Jesus, you better learn how to grow in your skill of relating. Because he intends you to grow in your skill of relating. Hey, I've got two points. Two points I want to make to you about this tonight. Uh, Point number one, if you're taking notes, we were made to need relationships. We were made for relationships. I would say it this way. Even criminals, even criminals that are in prison are punished with solitary confinement, right? Even if you find yourself alone on a deserted island all by yourself for years and years and years, what will you do eventually? Well, like my favorite movie tells me, you will create your own friend. And you'll begin talking to that volleyball all the time. And suddenly you're going to be sobbing tears when that volleyball is floating away. And you're going to be sobbing more tears for that volleyball than you do for your own wife when she tells you she's remarried to another guy. But that's another, <laughs> another story. Man, Wilson, he was such a good guy. He was such a good friend. But if you see that, you, see, you, you need relationships. You will, you will make them almost. You will create them. You will look for them. Everybody was born with a need for some sort of community, some sort of relationships. And if you check out your Bibles in Genesis 1 and 2, you will quickly see that mankind was created to be a group to bear the image of God. You were created to belong to a community. And there's even a passage in Genesis 2 where it says it's not good that man should be alone. And that's not just talking about men who who want to get married one day, necessarily. That possibly is also talking about just mankind in general. Mankind in general was meant to be in a group, relating with one another and therefore bearing the image of God together. You were meant to need one another. You were meant to grow with one another. And, and notice this, in your Bibles, all over the place, God always provides a place, a people, for his people. You always become a member of a community. You always enter into new relationships and perhaps cut off old relationships when you become a Christian. Just look in your Bible. You never see isolated Christians unless they are faithless or being persecuted or something like that. When you see the natural, normal Christian life, you see it in community. You see it in relationships. You were made, you were created to have relationships. And and I would even say this, as a Christian especially, we are called to pursue relationships. That, that, is, that is what we need in our life. And notice here in Ephesians 5, verse 15, Paul is talking to them about how they should walk as Christians, having received the grace of God in, in 5.15 of Ephesians. Therefore, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, 
Notice there the wisdom language, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. On account of this, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And then notice this. Notice all of these relationships. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And then, of course, he talks about the relationships between wives and their husbands and husbands and their wives, children and their parents, parents and their children, slaves and their masters. Notice, notice the the Christian life is a life of relationships, and it will impact all of your relationships as well. You were made to need relationships. Ephesians here speaks of wise living, and notice this, in an evil time. You are given the community of faith, the church, the body of believers, specifically because you need wisdom for evil days. You need each other. You need relationships. You need strong relationships. And the application there is seek them while you can. Grow in them while it is time. Because there may be a day where you want to lean on those relationships. And you will not have them if you do not seek them now. You need relationships now that you can speak and sing and relate to one another under God's truth. The bottom line here is we need one another And it's not just because we are human, but because we are God's people in a wicked day. That's why we need human relationships. And we need to be skilled in those relationships if those relationships are going to do us any good. If you are going to do any good in those relationships, you need to be skilled. And that leads us to the second point that I want to make tonight. Relationships that glorify God are not automatic. Relationships that glorify God are not automatic. Just because you're coming to youth group, just because you're coming to church, does not mean you are skilled in relationships. Just because you're good at talking in small group does not mean you are good at talking in small group, to put it that way. Uh, Just because you think of yourself as outgoing or as a people person doesn't mean you have the skill of relationships. Notice Ephesians 5 gives us a picture of skilled relationships, doesn't it? Uh, We are speaking and singing. We are relating to one another truthfully. We, We take God's word into account in how we interact with one another. We speak truthfully to one another. We see earlier in Ephesians where it says we speak the truth in love. That is a skilled relationship right there. Can you speak truth in love? That takes a lot of skill. And you are given this community, even here, to begin learning that skill. To learn truth and to learn how to speak that truth in a loving way. We're not called to just speak loving words. We're not called to just speak truthful words. We're called to speak true and loving words. But notice also uh, of this picture of skillful relationships we have here, we're also to be relating to one another, speaking and singing humbly. Humbly. Notice, notice there, notice there in, in, verse, in verse 20, always giving thanks for all things in the name of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, even the Father. And maybe you're saying to yourself, that has nothing to do with humility. But I would suggest to you, um, the true lives of thankfulness is actually the, the humblest life. And we'll learn more about that at summer camp. But notice, it is only the people that are humble that see themselves truly as they are spiritually before God as lost and deserving judgment that when they receive grace from Jesus and receive full forgiveness of sin, they respond to every situation with thankfulness. They enjoy every relationship, even the hardest one, with thanksgiving in their hearts because they do not deserve to be here. Is there anybody at church or in youth group that you maybe don't have the easiest time with? You can still be thankful for them because if they are Christians, they are people for whom Christ died. 
and you are someone for whom Christ has died, and you do not deserve to be here. And you should relate to one another humbly and therefore thankfully as well. But also notice this picture of skillful relationships we have here. We're also to relate to one another lovingly. We're to be subject to one another. There is this, there's this mutual, there's this mutual sacrificial sense to the Christian life. I'm going to intentionally put myself aside to seek the interests of someone else. That's a skillful relationship right there. I give up of myself. I I don't take all the rights, all the privileges, all the freedoms that perhaps I could take. I, I I don't do everything that I could do so that I can serve someone else. Do you want to make a difference in other people's lives? Do you want to be significant? It comes through loving sacrifice, submitting to others out of love for Christ as well. But notice also these people relate uh, to one another uh, dependently uh, as well. Notice all of this is under this idea of being filled with the Spirit in verse 18. They're not drunk with wine, they're filled with the Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? It doesn't mean you feel all mushy and gushy and happy inside. Uh, notice notice the, the picture that's being painted here in that very verse. What does it mean to be drunk with wine? It means you are controlled by something. It means you are dominated by something. It means you are influenced by something. What does it mean to be controlled by the Spirit? It means you are controlled by the Spirit. You are dominated by the Spirit. You are influenced by the Spirit. And that doesn't mean you just walk around like a zombie, like the walking dead. That doesn't mean that at all. It means, as we see in Colossians 3, that you are dominated, you are controlled, and you are filled by the will of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God fills your life, and you depend on the Spirit's strength to accomplish the things that God calls you to accomplish. Jesus' blood gives you the avenue to come to God. But the Spirit gives you the ability and the power and the strength to come to God and enables you to live, to walk out the Christian life once you are there. Look at this skillful relationship picture we have here. This is the wise life, the skillful relating life. It is a life to one another truthfully, to one another humbly, to one another lovingly, and to one another dependently. This is being skilled. Being skilled in relationships is, notice this, learned. It doesn't come naturally. You're not automatically skilled in this way. This is the kind of relationships that we want to develop here through small groups. This is the kind of relationships we want to have in church ministry as well. And we're seeking to help you guys get a head start on growing to be good church members as well. Because you already are church members. You are called to it, and by the help of the Spirit, you can change and grow in your skill in relationships. Now, I say all this, once again, not because I believe in you at all. Just to be honest, I I don't believe in you at all that you can do this, but I do believe in the power of Christ that transforms people. You may say to yourself, I am not outgoing. I am not telling you to be outgoing. I'm telling you to be humble. I'm telling you to be truthful. I'm telling you to be sacrificial. And I'm telling you to be dependent and see where that takes you. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, see where that takes you. You can, do, you can, you can see extraordinary change in your life simply through pursuing the means that God has given you. I'd also say this as well, right? Well, these, these relationships are not automatic, but you learn these relationships through, of all things, relationships. That's why we, we put you in small groups so that you can learn how to relate with one another. And let me just explain something to you here. You, you won't necessarily, necessarily learn the skill of friendship if you ignore the means of growing in relationships that God has already given you in your life, which is called being a good sibling. You won't necessarily be a good friend to someone outside of your family if you're a horrible sibling. Not a real friend, at least. You won't automatically learn the skill of being a good husband or a good wife if you are ignoring God's training ground for you now, which is learning to be a humble and obedient child. 
Now, some of you are like, I have no interest in being a husband or a wife. You will, trust me. I have a whole page on the last part of my document totally for you in the future. Um, you won't automatically learn the skill of being a good church member if you ignore the practical opportunities for service and love that God has given to you right now. The best church members are not the ones that are up in front talking all the time. The best church members are the ones who are driving other people to church. The best church members are the ones who joyfully plunge toilets to the glory of Christ. Those are the best church members. They sing with whole hearts of humble joy in their God and their Savior. You won't automatically learn any of these things if you simply ignore the relationships that God has given you in the present. And that's what we want to be. We want to be a stepping stone to help you grow in the skill of relating. You probably won't learn to patiently, lovingly serve others later in your life if you do not take advantage of all the opportunities that God has given you to lovingly serve others right now. And there's opportunities galore here, even in youth group, to lovingly serve others and to grow in the skill of of relationships. So we are here to be deliberate with you. Are you going to be deliberate with us? Because we really want to help you grow in your love and your knowledge and your wisdom in following Christ. By the way, I've been saying this all over the place. I've been saying, seeking to do intentional good for, for other people, to help other people walk after Christ. Basically, what I'm saying there is we're all about discipleship. That's what we're about here. We're about making disciples, and not just any disciples, disciples that will make disciples as well. You know what? Some of my favorite students are actually sitting right here in this room. They are the students that have not only been sponges towards leaders in their life, but they have also become leaders in their own right. They are students that younger students are already looking to and saying, I want to be like that older student when I get older, right? We, we are a discipleship-making ministry, and you will see that soon. Just, just let me walk you through what we're going to be doing. You see there on your, on your documents, the, the summer theme is the skill of relationships. Next week, we're going to be talking about the prize of friendship. Friendship is a prize. You can be a prize to someone else. You can be, a, as we'll say next week, a hot commodity in someone else's life that they will want and keep close to them. Or you can be a curse in someone else's life. We'll learn about that next week. Then, of course, we're going to talk about the folly of isolation. What, what, what it, how, how foolish it is to separate yourself from people, to try to go it alone, to be the Lone Ranger Christian in your fellowship. We're going to talk about the joy of friendship or something like that, Jaron. Um, we're going to be talking about the purpose of family and helping you grow in the skill of relationships. We're going to be talking about the dangers of friendship. We're not all about friendship here. There are some friendships that are particularly dangerous that I want to warn you of and guard you against. And we're going to talk about the opportunity of singleness. Some people don't know this, but singleness doesn't mean you lack a relationship. It means you have more opportunity for more relationships. We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about the the seriousness and joy of marriage, the, the highest human relationship there is. Once again, what we want to be about this summer and what we want to be about in youth group is purposefulness. We want to be purposeful for the glory of Christ and we don't want you to waste it. There was a student, there was a student that I talked to at the junior senior retreat who was thinking back on his life with tears in his eyes because of all the time that he had wasted. I don't want that for any of you. And he doesn't want that for any of you. Matter of fact, he is determined to do spiritual good to as many students as he can in his remaining time here, and I'm so proud of him. My dad always told me this, quote, show me the books you read and the friends you have, and I will show you who you will be in 10 years. Be deliberate with the books you read this summer. Be deliberate with the friendships that you seek to forge this summer, and I will show you what kind of people you will be in 10 years. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for this time we get to gather together. Thank you for your word and the blessing that it is. Thank you for these relationships that we get to look forward to. I pray that we would not waste our time here in youth ministry and in Acre this summer. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.